Daniel, thank you so much for coming on Fraud Busting. I got to tell you, I shot out of bed this morning. I was so excited. Like you're the, I love talking to all my guests, but you are just one that I could not wait to get to chat with today. So thank you so much. Wow. I, I, Tracy, I don't think I can live up to that, but I'm happy to uh, to do my best. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now let, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about me too, uh, because you uh, wrote the book and it's called, give me the title. Uh, Chasing the Thrill, Obsession, Death and Glory in America's Most Extraordinary Treasure Hunt. Exactly. So you're a treasure hunter and um, went searching for Fenn's treasure. Now, um, a lot of people have searched for Fenn's treasure over the last, what is it, 10 years? 10, 10 years, years, yeah. 2010 yeah, yeah. to 2020, effectively. Yeah. So uh, for those who aren't, I guess, indoctrinated into the crowd, there's uh, there's a old guy down in Santa Fe, art dealer, collector of a lot of, uh, I guess, ancient trinkets and things, and hit them all in a box put him in the woods somewhere and wrote this really cryptic poem about it. Um, and it turned into this huge hundreds of thousands of people have searched for this treasure. Now um, I I'm going to let you take it up from here. If you want to talk a little bit about the mystique and how you got involved in this and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you know, you basically captured it there. You know, Forrest Fenn was this ex fighter pilot turned arts dealer to the stars with big name in Southwestern art out of Santa Fe. And, in the late 80s, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he decided that, um, you know, he didn't want his story to end there on some levels. And he um, came up with a plan to uh, put some of his valuables, you know, about a million dollars worth, I think it's fair to say, in a uh, in a treasure chest. And um, he was going to go out there with it and actually take some pills and die next to this box out in the wilderness. Um, fortunately, he beat the cancer that he was not expected to survive in the late eighties, but he didn't let go of the plan. And so for the next 20 plus years, he kind of curated that treasure chest and worked on this poem that would lead people to it. And in 2010, he finally went out and put uh, this chest out in the wilderness somewhere. And he fortunately did not again, die next to it, but he came back and he published a memoir that um, contained the poem and contained stories about his life that potentially contained clues in them. And uh, then the treasure hunt began. He kind of just let it go. And then it started small, but uh, in around 2012, 2013, it got some real media coverage and it started to really blow up. And um, from there, it just was off to the races. And then, uh, so I came into that scene around 2017. I had never heard of it before, but a friend of mine who um, had been my, kind of my mentor in my last book, uh, Dueling with Kings, which was about the world of DraftKings and FanDuel, Daily Fantasy Sports, which kind of exploded onto the scene 2015. Um, he clued me in that this thing existed, that there was this treasure of Forest Fen. And, uh, you know, he decided he was going to go look for it. I should go look with him and I should go write about it. And all that sounded good to me. So I began, uh, you know, kind of a dual project of becoming a treasure hunter, but also a journalist in it trying to, you know, live that experience such that I could explain what it was really like to the outside world. So um, from about 2017 till, you know, 2020, that's what I did. And um, just tried to kind of live in that thing and, and experience it and get close to all the hunters and Forest Fen and understand the history of this thing, history of treasure hunting and all that so that I could relate that story to the larger world. Oh, I love that. Okay. So um, I have actually searched for Fen's treasure. Mm -hmm. And I sent you a little video uh, and the, 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 the majority of the searching I did was for an Australian reality TV show, right. yes. Yes. <laughs> but, but I got, um, I got to submit some questions to Finn and he actually answered some of them, like in a video, they had someone go in on the video and I know that you actually got to meet Finn himself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we talk about the world that this created, I mean, there are some unique characters <laughs> in that world. Like, I think like if they weren't searching or uh, doing like Dungeons and Dragons in their mom's basement, like they were out searching for treasure. So it's, it's an interesting kind of crowd that way, at least because several of them got in touch with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, because, you know, I'm a body language expert and that's what I do is read the body language but what did what did you experience with like what was the vibe like in the crowd because there was uh i read your whole book over the weekend okay. so um there was like festivals and conferences and you got to meet some of like the top people like let's talk about that 
Sure. Um, yeah, you know, so I mean, starting at, at I guess meeting Finn, yeah, you know, I mean, I got to interview him numerous times. You know, he was always, um, you know, I don't I think he didn't hate the idea that somebody was writing a book about his hunt. And so, you know, he uh, you know, he kind of welcomed me in that the first time was very funny because um, you know, I had kind of done this approach where I was gonna go and try to talk to people close to him because for if I don't get far spent into my book, I'm kind of, you know, SOL in terms of writing a good book right. about this thing. So, um, you know, first I would try to go to some of those more prominent hunters. So you kind of mentioned, you know, there are quote unquote, what I would call celebrity hunters within this thing, people yeah. who everybody knows and talks about, um, and they have, you know, outsized profiles compared to a lot of the other hunters. And so, um, the, uh, I went and tried to talk to a lot of them first so that hopefully, you know, they would decide that I'm not an idiot and then word would get back to Finn and he would want to talk to me. And so I talked to a bunch of them first. And then, you know, about a month and a half later, I went and, you know, finally tried to get in touch with Fenn and shot off that email and was like, you know, cover eyes, hit button. OK. And, um, you know, then he actually got back to me fairly quickly and he said, yeah, Danny, I'm familiar with your work from The Wall Street Journal. I'd love to come and talk to you. And I was like, there is almost no way he is familiar from my, with my work <laughs> from The Wall Street Journal. Um, he you know, I did sports and sports business at the Wall Street Journal, unless he was really interested in like the day to day affairs of the Yankees. I, I can't imagine that that was true. But at the same time, you know, that speaks to a lot of what was Fenn's thing. You know, he was very good at making people feel special, uh, connecting with them. You know, he was a real um, salesman and a showman. And he, you know, was very, very good at making sure people felt like the two of them were bonded in some way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that was likely his way of doing that. You know, when I got to his house, the Wall Street Journal was right there on the side table, uh, you know, or the, the, the entryway side table such that, you know, he could reference that. And I've heard that he's done that with other people in their publications. And so, oh, you know, yeah. he knows what he's doing. He has a whole routine in some ways. Um, and look, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, he's very practiced in a lot of these things. So, you know, every time I met him was very interesting. And you know, I got to do what a lot of people didn't, which was that I, you know, he, he did a lot of interviews, but he did not do a lot of interviews where the person came back on multiple occasions and then was able to go over, okay, well, let's talk about these last six months in the hunt. Let's talk about, you know, what happened here? What about this specific thing? You know? So in the first time I met him, it was very much, let's go over the basics. Let's go over mm -hmm. these things that it's almost like the exact, you know, paint by numbers formula of one of these larger magazine stories. And then on subsequent visits, I was able to kind of delve deeper and deal with him in different ways. And, uh, you know, that's when I felt like I was really starting to get somewhere a lot of levels. So, um, but yeah, you know, beyond that, you know, as you noted, there's a cast of characters in this thing that is really what makes it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, people who, yeah. You know, people who, who seek out a treasure hunt are going to likely be, um, you know, interesting characters in their own right. Uh, and that certainly was the case here. Uh, and so, you know, I got to really, you know, meet a lot of those people and try to understand what makes them tick and what this, why this thing speaks to them. And, you know, what the value is in it for them. And, you know, my biggest takeaway, you know, all these people came from very different lives and very different walks of life. I mean, I think you could, you know, there were some numbers that we kind of teased out. And I think anecdotally, they're true that this was, pardon me, predominantly male. Uh, it skewed older, you know, 45 mm -hmm. plus. Um, obviously, it wasn't all that, but I'd say that those two things were, were you know, in outsized quantity. Um, but, you know, what I, I did find in a lot of them uh, was the idea that these were people who were looking for validation who saw the hunt and the chance to find the treasure as, you know, a way to prove themselves and to, you know, perhaps achieve something that had been elusive in life um, and to, you know, finally make that great claim and that great score and not financially, although obviously that helps, but, you know, to show that they were and are special and that they could do this thing when no one else could. And I think that there, you know, that was something I, I felt like I, I encountered a lot within this, which is, you know, kind of an interesting quality and, and certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, but that this thing was going to be the way that they showed the world, you know, what they were truly made of. Now, here's what's so interesting to me about these treasure hunters is that there's uh, uh, like forums online. There was YouTube shows like weekly news YouTube shows. I was on one of those. <laughs> they oh. called me. Um and so there's there's all these people together, yet nobody really wants to reveal anything. <laughs> and I just thought that was fascinating uh, that in, in, in the way that they all tried to dissect these little uh, codes that Fen spoke in. Um, yeah. it, 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 it just kind of blew my mind. Like the numbers of people, and I'm sure they're coming out of the woodworks for you as well. My with, inbox with is a very what, cool place. Yeah, with what little involvement I had, how many, like I had people call me and tell me that they found it. Oh and yeah, I, all it, the time. 
That's so what, that I'm the true finder. I've got it. Da, da, da. This other thing is all BS. I can prove it. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every day, all the time. Oh, wow. So. Okay. All right. So I don't feel that unique then. So, <laughs> so well, now, now it, it, the story gets really interesting because, and I know you can add to this, someone in 2020, I think it was uh, in spring, I believe. June, actually, uh, almost, it, almost to the almost to the day. A last year, year ago. Uh, June, yeah. June 6th, 2020 is the announcement. Yeah. So someone finds it, or at least it's announced that it's found. Okay. But... Um, there was some other circumstances on that day that lend a little suspicion to things oh. that you wrote about in your book. You want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So the big thing was that on, on June 6, 2020, uh, Forrest Fenn announced that um, his treasure had been found. And, uh, you know, as you can imagine that, you know, set the community, you know, going agog as it of course would. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he didn't give a lot of information initially. Uh, he didn't tell much. He, you know, he just said that the man, the treasure had been found. I think in an interview with the Santa Fe New Mexican, he said been found by a man from back east. He wasn't going to reveal the location or the name of the person who found it, uh, but it was somebody he didn't know. Um, and, you know, more information will be forthcoming, but the treasure hunt's over, basically. And for a little while, that's all anybody got. And that, you know, in any kind of a vacuum, people are going to try to fill that with whatever they can, uh, you know, when there's not sufficient information that just leads to other things coming in. And so for a while, there was not sufficient information. Uh, you know, at, at first it took either 10 days, even for Finn to post pictures of the treasure chest being found to like essentially prove that it was no longer out in the wilderness. And then I think that finally set to rest many of the, you know, he never even buried it or never even hid it, pardon me, not buried, but never even hid the treasure chest kind of, um, you know, stuff that had been going on for a long time. And there was a lot of that that, that happened even in the 10 days after it was uh, announced that people would say, you know, look, this thing wasn't even really out there. He's mm -hmm. just ending his, you know, giant fraud, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know, there was a fair amount of that. Um, but then finally he released some pictures and he shows himself in an office with the chest. And then also, I believe, a picture of the chest out in the wilderness, you know, opened up, yeah. um, taken by the guy who found it. Um, and that was enough to at least prove some parts of it. But then, you know, people wanted more. They didn't feel like this was sufficient. They felt like they had you know, done this thing for a long time and they wanted more than that. And so, um, you know, there were a lot of questions and a lot of unhappiness and a lot of anger. Uh, and Fenn just really, for the most part, wasn't going to give in on any of it. You know, he, he just wasn't giving any more information. And so I think in, you know, in, in mid-July, maybe it was late July, he announced the uh, that it had been found in Wyoming. It was an attempt to give some people some closure, but honestly, mm -hmm. that didn't really work either. Because no. you know, I was upset. Were, yeah, people <laughs> really who thought was. it was in Wyoming, they were like, "Oh, then I was really close." People who didn't think it was in Wyoming, some of them said, "Oh, well, I wasn't close." And then some of them said, "Well, that doesn't matter. It's not true anyway. It was really in Colorado." And it's like, oh, okay, well, fine. Um, so you know, the, you you found that that wasn't as effective as I think Fenn thought it was going to be, um, but. You know, so the problem is people didn't feel like they had enough information. They didn't know if this finder was real. They didn't know if, you know, what was really going on, you know, where the treasure was, really anything. And then Fenn didn't seem to want to produce anything more. And so, you know, that created a lot of conspiracy theory. And, you know, one of the theories that was posited to me, you know, there were a lot of things flying around, but mm -hmm. one of them that was one of the better ones. Um, and one of the, at least had new information to it was that on the day that the find was announced, you know, there was an incident at Fenn's house. And this was told to me by Cynthia Meacham, who is one of, you know, kind of those aforementioned, you know, big name mm -hmm. hunters who was very close to Fenn and had a lot of information that other people didn't have. And, you know, she was willing to tell me, you know, on the record that uh, there's at that day, there was a guy who went to Fenn's house and, you know, the Fenn family found he and this searcher there uh, without masks and, you know, that there was uh, a big blow up about that. I and mean, obviously without masks is the middle of the pandemic, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, Fenn is, you know, was right on the verge of his 90th birthday at the time. So they wanted to protect him in so many ways. Uh, and that caused a real dust up. And Cynthia's hypothesis was that that led the family to essentially insist that Fenn call it off uh, that day. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, that was at least new information, um, you know, sourced information effectively that everyone else didn't know at the time. Um, and, you know, certainly led me to wonder, OK, I don't know what's going on here. You know, that certainly sounded plausible. Yeah, that is uh -huh. a thing that could have happened. You know, I mean, these treasure hunt has caused his, he and his family a lot of problems over the years and, you know, has not been the easiest thing. And, you know, that was not something that was necessarily going to, you know, if Finn 
died with the treasure still being out there, then, you know, that burden would largely transfer onto his family for all time. Yeah. And that's a tough thing to deal with. You know, that's not fun for anybody, you know, in terms of being in that position. Uh, so, you know, it certainly seemed plausible. Um, but then, you know, the reality, and so I was willing to entertain that as a concept for a while. Um, but, you know, then new information surfaced. And, uh, you know, then, you know, your responsibility in that case is to say, oh, well, it doesn't matter what we thought was plausible. We have new information now. We need to go look at, you know, the facts on the ground at this point. So, you know, after new information developed, I was, you know, I was immediately moved off that as a, as a viable concept. Really? So you don't even think it's viable? Yeah. I mean, that's not what I think happened at all. Okay. Um, you know, okay. I, once, once the finder revealed himself, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there's anything to that in the least. Okay. So let's talk about the how the finder revealed himself, how you out of everyone on the planet who wants to talk <laughs> to this guy, you are the one who's done it. Let's talk about that. Right. So um, the next major thing that happened in this was that Forrest Fenn died. And so in early September of 2020, um, you know, I, unfortunately for me, when I've been kind of making plans to come and talk to him about all this, uh, Fenn passed away. And unfortunately for everybody, obviously, nobody wanted him to die. Um, right. But at that point, you know, it seemed like, OK, you know, we may not have any more information about this ever. Like, who knows what's going to come of this now? And, you know, that was tough. That was tough to deal with uh, for a lot of levels, you know, for a lot of people. And uh, at that point, you're kind of just getting used to that. And then two weeks later, um, a, a, a post surfaced on the anonymous publisher, the publishing website Medium, where you can publish anonymously. And it's very good for that um, uh, by somebody who was identifying themselves as a finder. And, you know, he wrote this very long, I think, 3000 word essay where he described a lot about finding the treasure and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, penned an ode to Forrest Fenn, who he called his friend and, you know, really delved into a lot of stuff that we hadn't seen before. <clears throat> and he had also new pictures showing that, you know, this guy was legitimate. There was real stuff here. We should pay attention to this person. So, you know, a lot of people said this is fraudulent in some way. This is false in some way. But I did not think that for a second. I thought this guy, whoever he was. You know, what he was writing added up to me and a lot of things he said about Fenn added up to things that I had, you know, felt from dealing with him. And this person had clearly been a hunter. Um, they understood the emotions of it too well. So, I mean, this was somebody who, who everything he said rang really true to me. So I wanted to get in touch with whoever this person was. But right. part of the key about Medium and why it's so good as a publishing platform for anonymous people is that it doesn't let you get in touch with the author of an anonymous post. You cannot do it. There's no mm -hmm. like, write the author. Right, it doesn't right. work. So. And you could put your information in the comment section. And a lot of people did that. But if you do that, you're opening yourself up to anybody. There's nothing that guarantees that whoever writes you is the person who wrote the post. There's nothing. You, you've you just put yourself out there. So that's, you know, does nothing for you in my mind. Um, so what I figured out how to do was I figured out there's a way to send a direct message, very brief one to the author of a Medium post, which is to flag a typo in the mm -hmm. post and say, again, it gives you a little bit of space to explain what the typo is. And so excuse me, I flagged like a sentence towards the end, maybe it was a paragraph. And, you know, instead of saying you're tight, you have a typo, obviously there wasn't a typo. Right, um, right. I wrote, you know, this is me writing book, email me here, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And was hoping he had heard of me and he knew what I was doing, you know, because by that time I'd been in this hunt for three years, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, you know, I certainly was making no secret of what I was doing, you know, so uh, I didn't mean he'd heard of me, but it was not exactly like, you know, it wasn't hard to figure out or know about me at that point. So, um, uh, like a day later, I got an email back from a guy with, you know, with a treasure hunting related email address saying, I got your, your message through the post. Um, you know, I might be willing to talk to you. Let's discuss this. Mm -hmm. And so that set off essentially, you know, a couple months of back and forth, you know, email conversation where I didn't know who he was, just knew him as the finder. Mm -hmm. And we ended up talking about a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, effectively me trying to convince him that he should let me interview him and should I should be able to talk to him. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was, I was very much, you know, in cell mode um, mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, convince this person who I knew nothing about, you know, I had no biographical details, no frame of reference on him. Not um, even a name. No, especially not a name, yeah. <laughs> but also just nothing, no information about the person, you know, mm -hmm. um, nothing at all. It could have been anything. Oh, that's not true. I do in his post, he said he was a millennial. Um, oh, okay. And, and so I knew roughly an age range, you know, I knew I wasn't mm -hmm. dealing with a, a 65 year old then, but um, so I had millennial male pretty much who had student loans. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much all I knew about him, you know, with the exception of a few things that trickled out over the course of our conversations. Um, but so I basically just tried to convince him, you know, that he should talk to me. And mm -hmm. um, eventually, uh, so there were some lawsuits that were 
you know, targeted against Finn and by extension against the finder of his treasure yeah. by people who are unhappy. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there, there have always been a couple of these things, but, you know, people who said that they deserve the treasure or that Fenn had promised it to them somehow, or, you know, one woman put out one that said that the finder had hacked her email and found her solve and then gone and used it to find the treasure. And she was the true finder, you know, well, all so. those, all from what your book said, all those people filing the lawsuits were lawyers. So no one has gone to a lawyer to, to <laughs> right, do this. Know, like, that's what I got out of that. <laughs> I, I think that's, that's, you know, they, yes, they had the ability to do it yeah, without yeah, having yeah. to pay someone to do it. Yeah, and so, yeah. you know, make of that what you will mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so they, uh, you know, so one of the lawsuits had at least gone far enough where the finder thought that it's possible his name might come out in court. So oh, wow. um, he let me know that. And, mm -hmm. you know, he said, hey, this is this is who I am, basically. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, and then once he had told me who he was, I was like, well, if you think this is going to come out anyway, do you mind if I told the world about it instead, instead of it just coming out in a court document, I could yeah. write a story about it, you know, in a fairly mm -hmm. major publication. And yeah. he said, OK, sure. So, you know, then he he let me interview him over the course of like three or four hours one day over Zoom um, oh, on wow. this very computer. Uh -huh. And, um, <laughs> you know, we were able cool. to talk. And that was, you know, the first time I as far as I know that he was interviewed by anybody. And, um, you know, we we talked about everything and you know, not everything, but a lot of things. And, uh -huh. you know, I felt like I kind of got got a chance to get to know him to some extent. And, you know, then I published essentially the results of that uh, in, you know, uh, an article in Outside Magazine Outside, yeah. on December 7th, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, let the world know who this guy was uh, and that he was Jack Stoof, a 32 year old uh, medical uh, at the time, medical student out of Michigan or, or raised in Michigan. Um, and, uh, you know, from that point, there was a finder in the world and people, you know, had to then come to terms with that piece of new information. You know, even though I had felt pretty confident about that for several months now, I think, you know, until there was a a name out there, you know, the rest of the world wasn't really going to accept that. And so, um, well, let's, yeah. let, let's, let's talk about that just for a second. Yeah. Because I'm a body language deception detection expert. Okay. What am I doing wrong right now? Everything. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're, you're doing great. Um, <clears throat> but I'm watching you. So be careful. Okay. I know. Um, I know. I like <laughs> now what, um, what would, cause I've, I've read the, um, essay. I, um, I'm just curious, what did you get with talking to this guy that would lead you to believe that he was telling the truth? Like what was, cause it, is it like a gut feel thing or was there one thing that happened that you went, hmm, there's something there. Like it could be one line or something that he did. I'm uh, so I mean, there are, there are, there were various things. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of things. I mean, you know, we talked for almost four hours and this is somebody who, look, I've been interviewing people for 20 years. I'm not a right. body language expert, but sure. I've done a lot of things with a lot of people. Many of yeah. whom wanted to lie to me for various reasons. Um, <laughs> And he had a level of detail mm -hmm. to everything he was saying um, that was very authentic in my mind. You know, mm -hmm. he was either part of a very, 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 very self-involved deception or, you know, he was telling me what he knew, uh -huh. um, you know, and I could ask a million questions about something. And he was also very good about not telling me what he didn't want to. And, uh -huh. you know, he drew walls around certain things in certain areas that made sense. And, you know, didn't in other areas. Mm -hmm. And we would talk about, you know, all kinds of things. And so, you know, yeah, there were a lot of reasons that I felt like he was authentic. Um, you know, probably the biggest reason is in the book itself. But I'm not sure if you want to give that one away. Um, that you know, what he allowed me to do related to the treasure. We have to talk so, about that. We have well, to. Have to, is a, have to is not exactly necessarily a, a, a have to is relative. Okay. Um, but um, my heart will be broken if we don't talk about no, it. All right. All right. That. All right. We can. It's fine. it's fine. The book's been out for, you know, three weeks or whatever. We can talk about it. But um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, look, I came into that conversation having already seen the treasure mm -hmm. and having had the person who I corresponded with allow me to do that, you know, via their lawyers. So I had a pretty big, you know, flag of authenticity waving to begin with. Unless, and then, okay, unless it's a, he's a designated finder, right? Which is one, of, which I know you don't believe, but yeah. uh, that's what your eye roll there meant, right? <laughs> yes, you can read that body language pretty well. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think about that? theory like obviously you don't think much of it no i don't but it kind of, like it's plausible isn't it like it kind of there's a lot up. of things that are plausible and uh -huh. believe me i've been asked about all of them and they're all in my inbox there are a lot of things that are plausible in this uh -huh. um plausible doesn't mean probable uh -huh. and i think you know people seek to 
like because they can't know everything and honestly in this case even if they did uh-huh. you know there's a lot of investment in people who don't want this thing to be over or don't want it to have ended the way it said it ended and it, look is it theoretically possible that one or these various conspiracy theories because uh-huh. they're all you know there's 15 of them that are out there oh, or whatever yeah. mm-hmm. um that one of the various ones is right yeah i guess it's theoretically possible but i don't have any reason to think that you know i mean again i've had I had the benefit of doing a number of things that nobody else did. Mm-hmm. Primary, which is, you know, seeing the treasure. But, you know, in some ways, that's not even primary. Maybe the primary is being able to talk to this guy and ask him whatever and have him just respond in real time, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you get a lot of your questions answered that way. And look, there were things that, you know, he would discuss off the record that are not in the book. There are mm-hmm. things that he, you know, would discuss that, you know, did just didn't make the cut because of space reasons. And a lot of those things are things that, you know, in the aggregate, made me feel pretty good about, you know, really? this is not some grand conspiracy, you know, this is a guy who looked for this treasure over a long period of time and really worked at it. And eventually he got it, you know, and I, I just don't have any reasons to doubt that just because something also makes sense. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean it's true. Oh yeah. You know, doesn't yeah. <laughs> now, okay, <laughs> I know okay. that that's not as fun for people a lot of the time, you know, it doesn't give you the same level of investment in the story, uh-huh. but doesn't mean it's wrong right so, okay so so for people listen here's why you gotta get the book is because <laughs> you get to find out how you ended up and how much of the treasure you got to see and um, oh, all of it as far as i know i, well, I, was, trying, I was trying to leave a little room for people to buy the book no it's all right if we're just <laughs> doing it we can do it no i mean look i uh <laughs> You know, uh, as part of, you know, my discussions with him, um, the finder was nice enough to let me fly out to Santa Fe and actually see the treasure, which, you know, makes me at, certainly at the time made me, you know, one of a very, very, very small handful of people who was able to do that. And I was able to go and go to this lawyer's office and, you know, go in there and basically play around with the treasure chest. And now see, I wanted I wanted the finder, Jack, to be there. I was like, where's freaking jack well, he like, doesn't what? live in santa fe <laughs> i don't care where he lives i wanted you to meet him <laughs> i mean look i would like to i've never met him in person you know again uh-huh. i've done very i've talked to him many times you know in various formats but um i've never met him so i'd like to meet him too and look, who knows maybe someday we will maybe. but uh, you know pandemic conditions did not make that easy and this was yeah. a trip that came together very fast you know in terms of uh you know he said hey do you want to see this thing and i was like yes i want to do that at the earliest opportunity yeah um and so i did you know and don't forget i was on a book deadline too so the earlier i could actually see this thing was the better for my purposes because that allowed me to go do that and then immediately turn around and write the thing you know well, so. now didn't you finish the book because i because i heard you on the outside podcast didn't oh, you yeah. finish the book and then all of a sudden the treasure got found and you had to go back and <laughs> yes well, right. it. well the last essentially three chapters of the book mm-hmm. as it exists in actual real book form yeah. are nothing like you know the original kind of three manuscript draft chapters i had that i turned into my editor either at the very end of may or like the first day of june i don't remember which it was but that was mm-hmm. essentially my deadline for turning in the book, you know, version Mm -hmm. 1.0. It was always scheduled for publication around this time this year. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how much you know about like book publication stuff, but there's an incredible lead time to it. Oh yeah, it's like a year, year and a half sometimes. Yeah, right, exactly. And, you know, so they want to have huge amounts of time when you actually turn these things in. And so that's what I did. And, you know, I think, okay, well, nobody's going to find this treasure anytime in the lifetime of the book. So, you know, I had some kind of, <laughs> you know, what I would call, frankly, subpar navel gazy ending chapters. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, they were fine. They did the job. They got you out of the book. But I don't think it was anything that was very good. Uh, and so, you know, it's funny because then when the treasure was actually found, like a week later, you know, my first thought was like, ah! no like the world has just ended yeah i'm so screwed i have to now like rip up like half the book and account for it um what the hell am i going to do um but it actually ended up because of the things we just talked about being like an incredible boon for me because i was able to you know get this crazy story of who the finder was and you know document all that stuff and you know have things that nobody else had and you know really in ways that i never expected to insert myself into the story and become a part of it in a way that i certainly did not think was going to happen and was oh, not the intention it's, but it's divinely uh it's kind of crazy done, honestly like, for so sure. like it was pretty nuts and so mm-hmm. i was uh i was I was very lucky to have that happen but like at the time i was like oh no <laughs> like i'm so screwed now. Oh my God. um but 
you know, again, until like until September, you know, I was just like behind the eight ball, just like trying to figure out like, you know, OK, well, what's happening now with this? What's happening now? Oh, great. Now, Forrest Fenn just died. Like, I have nothing, you know, so all that stuff came together pretty fast in the September, oh, yeah. through December period. And so, you know, I was just rushing to the finish because, you know, <laughs> December is, you know, not even six months before the book was due to come out. And so <laughs> they did not like that I didn't have an ending, you know, in that time frame. And they mm-hmm. were very, very good in trusting me to that I was getting good stuff and I promise you, I'm getting this done. I'm sorry. It's all happening in real time. It's all uh-huh. happening like right now. Um, so I very much had to kind of race against time for all those purposes. Uh, and so that's why, you know, I was like, look, I'll get to Santa Fe. If you let me see this thing, I'll get there basically tomorrow, effectively. Yeah. You know, I, it took me a few days more than that. But, you know, I got out there as fast as I could and I got back and got writing as fast as I could uh, in a nice little quarantine hotel and, uh, you know, yeah, do whatever yeah. work I could on the back end. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, was able to, you know, see and go through and document what was in that treasure chest. Now, and, you know, w- yeah. what's it really like when someone brings <laughs> this thing in, like, cause it looked like kind of a little cement box is what it, in, in you can look it up on bronze, not cement it, bronze. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bronze, but it's been out in the woods for 10 years and you know, it's worth just a fortune. <laughs> and, and so you're in this lawyer's office, like, and they bring this thing in and sit it down in front of you. Like what, on what could be going through your mind? Like, were you shaking or like, was it like this big victory moment? I don't know like, if I what, was shaking. Was it? it was, it was very sudden, certainly. So like first, you know, you go in there and you're like, how am I going to do this? I was like, I should get like gloves. So, yeah. you know, I, I went like on the way down there, I actually stopped at a supermarket on, uh, on Surio Avenue, I believe in Santa Fe, like big main thoroughfare. And yeah. uh, I was like, I need gloves. So I like rush into this, I don't remember even remember the name of the supermarket, but you know, standard supermarket place uh-huh. and like buy a pair of gloves as soon as I could find them, like rush in there and then like rush back to the car. And I'm like, okay, now I'm going to be late, but I have gloves and they'll probably want that. And of course I come into the office and there's like a thing of plastic, you know, gloves, like right on the table there. Uh-huh. And I was like, all right, fine. Well, whatever. I, I made the effort. Um, and so, you know, like this is in theory, like a valuable sacred ish thing. I shouldn't mm-hmm. like treat it lightly. So so I go in there and, you know, I was definitely, you know, like, I wouldn't say I was nervous because that's not really right. It was more like, you know, Ooh, this is a big moment. Um, and so, you know, the guy just kind of brings it in he's like, here you go. And I was like, Oh, okay. Um, and it was heavy. It was legitimately heavy. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, trying to place it down on this glass covered table. And, um, you know, at that point it's like, okay, I'll just kind of open this treasure chest that is just here that I've spent the last essentially three and a half years. Like, yeah thinking about and obsessing over in various ways and has this thing that has been the the core of this experience for so long and so like just kind of picked it up you know or opened the box you know and yeah. then you know there's a treasure there and there's uh-huh. all this stuff and so you know the chest is not and I, this is the book but it's not that big you know i mean in some senses it is both overwhelming and underwhelming pardon mm-hmm. me in that it's you know it's not very big at the same time. It's this treasure that you've thought so much about and you can finally see these items yeah, and yeah. take out these gold nuggets. And, you know, it's, it's just such a cool experience to get to do that. And, you know, I found myself, you know, in one sense, slightly out of control in the way that I was like, like taking things out of the uh-huh. chest because like, you know, I, I think in the book, you know, I gave it the kind of Christmas morning description, but like the idea is that, you know, you're just, you're just ripping these things open because you want to see what you get, you know, like uh-huh. you, and So I was taking all the things out and I I didn't want to get to the bottom because when you do, that means there's nothing else in there, you know? And so I was kind of just, it was, it was like a, almost like a voracious hunger to get through to what's the next thing. And here's this, and here's that, and here's this, and what's this, and whoa, what's that, you know? And then you get to the bottom and there's a little bit of disappointment there because there's just the bottom of this chest and it's empty, you know, and you, you've seen what there is to see in it. And there's not, you know, I don't know, some magical you know, the Holy grail isn't in there or whatever, Uh you know, Mm -hmm. whatever it was going to be, there was what he said there was, there was Forrest Fenn's treasure. And that is amazing. But also when you have done that, you know, there, I think at least for me, there couldn't help, but be a slight feeling of like, Oh, you know, that I got to the end of it. Uh And so, um, yeah, you know, kind of that point though, I kind of shifted very quickly into like, you know, reporter mode and started to like yeah. try to document what was in the chest because nobody else had had this opportunity, certainly nobody else in my position. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I felt like I had a responsibility to try to like catalog what it all was. And so, you know, I started just taking pictures of all the stuff and then, you know, trying to write down, okay, you know, this many of these type of coins and this many big nuggets. And, you know, I, I did, you know, kind of an imperfect job, but like, 
look, I had a limited amount of time, you know? And so <laughs> they're kind of like trying to live this experience of seeing this thing and feel it all. And remember, because I have to now relate it onto the page very quickly. Um, but then also, you know, try to do what I could to document what was in this thing. And so um, just did that really. And uh, you know, then, and once I felt like I had done that and then I, the, the, the lawyers were actually smart enough to say, do you want us to get some pictures of you with it? And I was like, yeah. Oh yes. I very much need that because this is the world of forest fan and literally no one will believe this happened if I don't have pictures of myself. Now, with it. now, cause I just read the book, the ebook that your publisher sent. Do you have real pictures in the book? Do you have those? Pictures? No, I don't. And that's oh. funny. So um, like one of the things that forest fan would say to me, like every time, and he was says pretty much every time that uh -huh. we would sit down was, are you going to have pictures in your book? And I was like, no forest. I don't think it's really that kind of book. And I don't think I'm really going to have very any good pictures anyway. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and he was like, you should have pictures. You know, pictures are better. And I was like, OK, fine. I just didn't envision it that way. And I didn't uh -huh. have any, you know, for 90 percent of this, I didn't have any pictures worth presenting. Um, so, you know, it's funny that in the end he was very right that, yeah. you know, it was it was way too late by that point. But then I had pictures that were very much worth putting. In the yeah, book. yeah. Now I didn't have the opportunity to do that. Anywhere? Put them on a blog, do something. Oh, they're on my website. Oh, they are. So, oh, OK. Yeah, and your so, website yeah. is yes. uh, Daniel Barbara OK, OK, cool. So, cool. Yeah. And um, um Okay, so and they and some of them have been published in various like book excerpts and things like that, which you know set various parts of the community of flutter when for instance the first picture of the treasure was with me with it was uh -huh. and the treasure all out on the table was in the outside. Oh no, actually it was two different pictures. There was a there was a picture that I put out in the outside magazine excerpt that ran, I think the day before the book came out, and that has me with the treasure, and then one in my current player, the athletic. Uh -huh. um, there's a picture of me with like the treasure all out on the table. And so both of those should be on my website. Now I just generally put them there after they become public. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, but yeah, no, so far as was right. I should have pictures in the book, but it oh was unfortunately too late by that time. So now, can, can you, I, I'm just curious if you have a sense, was this in Northern Wyoming or Southern Wyoming? I have no idea. You have no idea. No. Oh, cause one I of the, just... one of the parts of, you know, what the arrangement essentially that mm -hmm. you know, the finder and I made was that, you know, I wasn't going to actively try to find out from him the location of the chest and thus use that, you know, oh, and I don't think yeah. he would have let me interview him if that was the case, you know, mm -hmm. and so, you know, that I essentially made that very clear to him that I understood his reservations for that. And I'm not right. going to try to use whatever I glean from him, you know, in the course of conversations where he was being pretty open mm -hmm. to, you know, then reverse engineer a solution. Right. So, you know, I don't know. And I haven't known. And honestly, it, it was a very good decision not to know because Ultimately, that would have ended up with me being like a conduit for people who want to know oh, the answer yeah. to this mm -hmm. and can't get Jack to tell them. And so they would just go to me. So like, yeah. I am very happy to tell anyone who wants to know, I don't know where the treasure is and I am not trying to find out. And I'm not, you know, I, I the cost of doing that well outweigh the benefits for me. So oh, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, want to put it. myself in that position at all. And believe me, a number, the, the number of people who ask me anyway um, is very high. And I have to tell them the same thing. Like, I don't know, man. And I don't want to know. Oh, uh, see, I want to know about the clues. I want to know. Well, sure. I mean, intellectually, if, I'd like to know. If you but, read the clues, Daniel, mm -hmm. my last name is Brown. This thing could be. You have my, the treasure. It could be in my backyard, right? Yeah. And I'm like, yes, the home of Brown, <laughs> wherever you live. You're, you're the treasure. I am. So, exactly. And look, there's that kind of speed. You could, I'm sure you could find that on the internet if you wanted to. Every oh, yeah. possible conspiracy is. Is on the internet somewhere on this. It's all out there. Well, thank you so much. Um, make sure you yeah, look, we can talk longer if you want. You know, it's fine. You know, oh, um, yeah. Well, I got here a little late, so I don't know if you can, but you know. Oh yeah. No, I th I think we're good. I think okay, we got cool. enough. So so because uh, I gotta tell you, um, Chase, it's it is worth a read. It is it's worth you I think you did a fantastic job digging into the the culture and the community and actually came out the other end in victory um <laughs> as, a, as a writer i could not give you higher props for for what you've done so thank you hey, go big, write me some nice amazon reviews man <laughs> yeah yeah big high five to you so thank make you. sure make sure everybody go out and get chasing the thrill you're gonna love it and you are calling no fraud on yeah, i mean look the forest yeah, I, I just don't meal. i don't i don't see it honestly you know and again i was willing to entertain you know, those kind of things when we didn't have a lot of information. And then mm -hmm. I went and got a lot more information, you know, mm -hmm. and at that point, you know, I felt pretty good about what I learned. Um, mm -hmm. And look, cause again, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea that like, you, know, you read the book, a mm -hmm. lot of these treasure hunts have ended in some sort of malfeasance. You know, mm -hmm. this is a world that has that kind of stuff almost endemic to it, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean it always does happen, but you have to be, you have to be, you know, open to that possibility. And I certainly 
have been. But once I got the information that I got, I felt pretty good that like most of these things happened the way that we think they did, you know, that they effectively this this went this way. So, yeah, you know, um, yeah, I feel I feel pretty good saying that you crushed it. Love it. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>